Hi team, good morning. Um, I'm Sophie, I'm a tech marketing engineer at NVIDIA, and as you now know, I already want to talk to you today about avoiding anti-patterns in technical communication. We'll keep it light, we'll keep it quick, we'll keep it breezy, we'll get back to our coffee. But first, we'll start with some audience participation. So, who can tell me what an anti-pattern is? Oh. Hi, yes, hi. Uh, Perfect. Do you want to come and give the next? Um, is, is it in my head or can I hear me? <laughs> um, so, yes, exactly. The term anti pattern was first coined in the world of tech in 1995 by a man called Andrew Koenig, and it's used to describe this idea of a process, a structure, or a pattern of action um, that often appears to be a good response to a problem or a way of doing things initially, but in time, it actually has more bad consequences than good. So common examples in the world of tech um, are the notion of a god class in software engineering. So the idea is that when you start writing your program, you put everything in one massive class, it has all of your methods, and over time it builds and builds. Really easy to find all your stuff because it's all exactly in that same place. But if you wanna make changes, things can quickly get unwieldy. Making a minor change to your code becomes extremely complex because the code is actually just one tightly coupled ball of spaghetti, and so if you change one thing, everything else breaks along the way. Um, another anti-pattern we see in tech, particularly in kind of project management, is death by planning. Spending tons of time on planning down to the final last detail to make sure that you feel super prepared for the upcoming sprint, month, quarter. Um, but making such a tight and rigid plan takes ages. And instead, if we actually spent less time planning, um, creating only a nice outline of our plan, we're better equipped to execute, to solve problems when they arise, and react to any changes in strategy or focus areas as we need to, as well as incorporating feedback. So in tech, anti-patterns are everywhere. I'm sure that you can think of many more. Um, and I'm sure we'll see some today, like starting a talk with audience participation or starting a talk by asking for a definition. There's tons of great books out there, blogs and guides on uh, how to identify anti-patterns. And if you can identify them, then it's gonna reduce your chances of actually falling into these traps and repeating them, them yourself. So whether you're writing code, you're building systems, you're doing project management, or you're doing business processes, there's tons of content out there to teach you how to not fall into the traps of these anti-patterns. But one area that's always overlooked is technical communication. So one thing that PMs, engineers, data scientists, managers, CEOs, everybody in this room has in common is that in our work, we have to communicate ideas and information. And I'm not just talking here about giving uh, conference talks, from sending Slack messages, to writing blog posts, to tweeting, to having a phone call with someone. Tech communication is such a key part of any role, and being able to do it well opens a ton of doors in the industry. If you're a good communicator, you can you know, put yourself on that. Uh, next step in your career. You can share your ideas and you can influence people. So in the rest of this talk, I want to chat about common anti-patterns in tech communication. By calling these out today and thinking about them, I hope that we can go on to avoid them in the future, help your colleagues to avoid them too. So anti-pattern number one is keeping it brief. When I started out my career, I spent a lot of time worrying that everyone else knew way more than me, um, and so was already thinking 10 steps ahead of me, and also that everyone else was far too busy and important to help me. And what that meant is that I would send Slack messages that looked like this. I'm stuck on training the model, the notebook won't run. Now, this statement is potentially true. I failed to run a lot of notebooks in my life, and it only takes a colleague a matter of seconds to read this, so I haven't wasted their precious time yet. 
but if they want to be helpful to me, which they usually did because most of my colleagues are very lovely, then they'd have to put a lot of additional effort and questioning in in order to get anywhere, and that's taking up my time and theirs. From there, I sort of zigzagged into the other side of things. I wanted to make sure that people knew I had been working very hard, and I'd write things like this. I'm stuck on training the model. I can run these cells, but the rest of the notebook won't run. It takes ages. Yesterday, I did something else. It can, make it, it can be difficult to make sure that you're not also over-communicating. If you're working closely with someone on a project or someone um, that has a lot of knowledge about a topic, we don't want to you know, fill them with information that they already know. Um, and we don't want to give them information that's relevant to the outcome. We're either going to end up patronizing them or boring them to death. You know, sharing 27 pages of error logs uh, might give them a ton of information and might enable them to help you, but uh, very little of those 27 pages are going to be useful, um, and it's not a nice and engaging way to talk to your colleagues. So the key here is balance. We've got to make sure that we're communicating the things that count. In this case, think about what information you'd ask. If I hit you up with that you know, brief, my notebook is failing note, I'd want to know what projects you're working on, which model my training, where is the notebook running, why doesn't it run, what error am I seeing, is it repeatable, all the sensible things. Um, and also make sure you're communicating what you want from other people, whether that's what you want to get out from the interaction. Um, in this case, do I want them to make a suggestion as to why my notebook might not be running? Do I want them to hop on a call to debug? Um, do I just want to have a little vent? Is this one of the scenarios when you just want them to say, oh, that's the worst, and then go on with their day? Um, and we've used Slack messages here as an example, but the same concept applies to any type of technical communication. If you're writing a blog post um, or chatting with someone in the corridor, you know, you want to get to your point quickly. You want to give that critical information to your colleague without pages and pages of waffle. So fundamentally, if you're not being clear and concise, then you're wasting people's time. The next anti-pattern that I want to touch on today is this notion of chasing likes. And to help us out here, we're going to work with an analogy. So for just a minute, let's think about machine learning models. This blue box is my machine learning model or machine learning pipeline. It takes in data. It spits out predictions. Now, I tell you that my machine learning model is 99% accurate. Are you impressed? Was that a yes? Thank you so much, that's so kind. Um, so now suppose my model is a binary classifier. Some people said no, and I think they might be kind of going down this road. I've got a binary classifier. We're predicting um, that data is going to belong to one of or two classes. It either belongs to class A or class B. And it turns out that less than 1% of my test set belongs to class B. So my model is actually going to be 99% accurate if it just assumes that everything goes in class A. That's all it returns, class A. Not so impressive anymore. OK, we've thrown that model out. I've got a new model. I tell you that it can make predictions really fast. Are we impressed? Oh, thank you. Yes, we are impressed. OK, but they might all be completely wrong, right? I can give you the wrong answer very quickly, and that's not going to help any machine learning system. So in both of these contrived cases, um, we're measuring the performance of our model using the wrong metrics. Um, and in order to get good results from our machine learning systems, we need to think about what we really care about with our machine learning model. Make sure that we're using the right metrics to enable us to achieve the goals that we actually care about. So this same idea applies to tech communications. We need to make sure that we're measuring the performance or goodness of our technical communications with the right metrics, looking out for the things that we care about. So when you write a tweet, there's nothing better than seeing you know, the number of likes, retweets, increase, the number of views, as you can now see, if anyone's still on Twitter. Um, and similarly, you know, if you write a blog post and the reads increase or you see the claps go up on Medium, it feels lovely, right? 
so it's very easy to start uh, measuring our content's goodness by these metrics. They're so visible to us. Um, and you find yourself thinking things like, oh, this blog post I just wrote wasn't as good. It's only had half as many views in the first month as my previous one that went viral. And then this causes you to chase these numbers and to try and create the content that's going to get the likes. Now, in practice, that's probably going to be the content that appears to a large audience. Disclaimer, what I'm not trying to say here is that viral posts are bad. What I'm saying is that it's important to stop and think about why you originally decided to share your technical knowledge. The things that result in tons of likes and retweets are not necessarily going to align with the things that you wanted to share, the things that you wanted to use to build your brand, or the great information that you've got in your brain that you want to communicate with the rest of the tech community. So obviously, the kind of posts that everyone wants to share is absolutely personal preference. But if you find yourself spitting out more and more mass content that you personally don't find interesting or unique in order to receive engagement that doesn't excite you or allow you to grow or hear from interesting voices in the community, then it's really probably not worth your time. You need to think about who the target audience is of your tech communication and what you want to get out of it. So, I hope that everybody enjoyed following along with that nice analogy between uh, measuring the performance of your machine learning system or model using useless metrics and chasing unfavorable tech content metrics. Our next anti-pattern is using useless analogies. I want to lead with this quote from one of my colleagues that was made earlier this week. Using a bad analogy is like listening to any Taylor Swift album and skipping the fifth track. So I'm a big Tay-Tay fan. This is a great analogy for me. But if you're not a massive Swifty, so a man in the front row shaking his head, then this is likely useless. So just for context, track five on a Taylor Swift album is always arguably the best track. Dear John on Speak Now, My Tears Ricochet on Folklore, and All Too Well on Red. We could go on. But analogies only work when the concept you want to relate to is well understood by your audience. And the two concepts that you're drawing a similarity between are actually similar. Everyone needs to have the same frame of reference. And in you know, our global world, that gets more difficult. So we're at an international conference today with many attendees from all around the world. And I'm yet to hear a bad analogy in a talk, apart from the one that I just gave you. Um, but for all of my career, I've worked as part of a global team. And the worst analogies I hear are usually football related. And I'm talking that football, not that football. Um, I have no idea what's going on with that football. Um, another painful one for me is drawing analogies on cultural events. So is everyone aware that Will Smith punched somebody at the Oscars? Is everyone aware of who Will Smith is? Everyone knows what the Oscars are? OK, just checking. So after the Will Smith Oscars punch situation, um, I was sent a blog post to review um, for a reputable blog that was titled, What Will Smith Can Teach You About Data Science. <laughs> now, it was humorous. It was timely. But fundamentally, there just wasn't a strong comparison you could draw between punching somebody at the Oscars and putting an XG Boost model into production. So it's really important to step back outside of the analogy, think about what's going to make timely content, what's still going to be relevant and useful in five years' time, once he's you know, been forgiven and no longer punches people at the Oscars. Um, if your content is interesting, and I know you've got brains full of interesting content, given uh, that we all work in an interesting industry, then I know that you can explain it well without having to lean on props. So the final anti-pattern we'll talk about today is focusing on the tricky bits. Now, as I just mentioned, we're really lucky to get to work in an industry where we get to think about complex systems, difficult problems. Our roles are forever changing. We're essentially paid to learn things and figure out new things. It's fantastic, right? So we spend a lot of time solving tricky, new, interesting problems. Um, and being so close to the tech and so close to the cutting edge can often make it difficult to share information at the right level. If we think back to our machine learning model, we represented it by a cute little cube, six sides, very simple, not much going on. 
But we know that in practice, there's tons that has to happen in order to create that machine learning model from you know, feature engineering, model validation, putting it into production as part of a broader system, monitoring it. Even this uh, workflow here is well simplified. If you've ever worked on any of these stages, I can guarantee that you spent um, what felt like a ridiculous amount of time you know, finding or fixing a wiggly little bug in there. Um, or diving into a niche aspect of feature engineering or model validation. And maybe you want to write about that or talk about it in a conference talk. Fantastic. That's something new and interesting to talk about. But you need to remember that you worked on this for ages. You have tons of context. You're essentially the expert and potentially the world's leading expert on this problem, on this data set, and so on. Um, so you don't want to write a blog post that is for people who already know as much as you. If they already know it, they're not going to gain anything by reading your blog, and everyone else is going to be lost. You need to make sure that you're bringing the audience along with you. Similarly, for things like release blogs in open source communities, it's really tempting to focus on the things that took the team the most time to fix. Um, that caused the most pain throughout the releases, that had the most bugs opened you know, on that pull request. Um, but the interesting stuff is the user-facing changes. That's the thing that your audience is really going to care about, and that's the thing that really makes the users' lives easier. So again, we need to step back and focus on the things that really matter. So we've covered four um, anti-patterns in tech communication today. And my goal is that by pointing these out, they may seem obvious, but by pointing these out and by naming them, you'll know them when you see them, and you won't use them yourselves. Um, so we want to make sure that we're not keeping things too brief. Make sure that you're giving someone enough context and being clear about your desired outcome or end goal. Um, what do you want someone who reads your work to be able to do? Or what information are you trying to convey? What do you want someone to take away from a conversation with you? We need to make sure that we're not chasing likes. Uh, we don't want to be measuring ourselves by metrics that we don't actually care about. Um, and make sure that we're also not using useless analogies. Everybody that we're talking to is going to have a different perspective, a different background, and a different understanding of the thing that you're trying to make that connection to. So if in doubt, just don't mention Will Smith at the Oscars. Um, and finally, don't focus on the tricky bits. Think about what you want to convey and make sure that you're communicating things in a way that brings people up to speed with you rather than assuming that they're already there. We don't always want to write for an expert or write for yourself. So with all of these anti-patterns, you've learned new ways to think about and be sensitive to what your audience needs to get out of any communication. Um, and one way to avoid almost all of these anti-patterns in technical communication and many others is to just consider your audience. Put yourself in their shoes, think about what they want to know, um, and this enables you to create technical content and communicate ideas in a way that's going to be engaging, effective, and efficient. And finally, we need to make sure that we listen to our audience. We need to listen to what people want to hear, listen to what they're doing, understand where they're coming from, um, and communicate appropriately. So now I'm going to put myself in, my sh in your shoes and consider my audience. Um, I'm assuming that you're ready for coffee, as it is very early. Um, so I want to say thank you for joining me. Um, I'm happy to listen and answer any questions, if there are any, but I'm also happy to chat later. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for her? Yeah. Hi. Uh, what do you consider a good metric for the success of blog posts, if it's not likes or page hits? That's a great question. What do you consider to be a good metric for blog posts, if it's not likes or reads or so on? 
So first off, that really depends on you know, personal preference. If you've just released a new product, maybe it is likes or reads. Maybe you want to increase the visibility of that product um, or tool or technique. But um, for me, something that I really like is um, kind of uh, unique engagement. So if someone leaves a comment, if someone says, oh, hey, I tried this and this helped me, um, then that's what is often interesting to me and useful for me um, when I've written a blog. But yeah, again, it completely depends on the content, right? Just as the metrics you'd want to use for your machine learning model depend on uh, the type of model and your type of system. We have time for one more question. I think we might have time for coffee. Right. All right, well, thanks for joining me so early, team. I appreciate it. <laughs>